I'm joined live once again by CNN aerospace analyst Miles O'Brien and Janet Ivey of the National Space Board of Governors. Janet, tell us what are we looking at? These are the live pictures of the spaceship <laughs> coming back. You know, it's just thrilling, and I can only imagine, you know, the full G-forces their bodies are feeling as they kind of like are heading back to Earth. But what this crew has to celebrate is so monumental, uh, from the space tech that they were able to test out to the successful uh, kind of like Starlink space lasers and the downlinks that were done there. And, you know, they've trained for two years together as a team for this entire mission. And I think it's just been inspiring to watch. And what's <coughs> going to be really exciting is what else will be accomplished because of their efforts. Janet, I'm just gonna jump in here because you're looking at these grainy pictures, but it appears that the parachutes have been opened. Perhaps we should uh, listen in to, to SpaceX mission control. Dragon SpaceX visual on two healthy drogues. Nothing at SpaceX, we show the same. <laughs> These drogue parachutes help to stabilize the Dragon capsule and get it into the right orientation before those main parachutes uh, pop out, as well as providing that initial deceleration. This is such a great thermal shot of the, the Dragon capsule. You can see it turning a little bit with the drogue parachutes. And there are the four main chutes now deployed. They'll slowly open up to their full uh, deployment here in just a few seconds. Incredible views of the Polaris Dawn crew returning to Earth after five days <laughs> in Earth's orbit. The crowd here at Mission Control in Hawthorne cheering. <laughs> it's a beautiful sight to see. Copy 1,000. Beautiful sight to see those four healthy main parachutes. So great. Now, yeah. in about two minutes, we expect our splashdown to occur. And you may hear the crew in the core talking. They're uh, communicating about their altitude as they make their way back down to Earth. We should start. 800. Yeah, there it is. So we should start to hear and our, our hearing uh, our commander, Jared Isaacman, call out the altitude as they descend to the ocean's surface. We can see the Polaris Dawn crew nestled in their seats there on the left-hand side of your screen as they anticipate their splashdown. Copy, six. And you can see the difference in velocity. This is a lot gentler than just a few minutes ago. The Dragon is coming back down to Earth. Absolutely. <laughs> These main parachutes deploy at about 119 miles per hour and help slow the Dragon capsule down to about 15 miles per hour when it makes contact with the ocean. You can also see that the capsule is down. The capsule is now stabilized. It's no longer spinning like we saw it with the drug parachutes. Two hundred, we're bracing. Copy two hundred and brace. Bracing for splashdown. That will be the final call we hear from Jared until contact with the ocean surface. Standing by for a splashdown of the Polaris Dawn crew. And there you can see. 
as you can see on your screen. And by the cheers behind us, the Polaris Dawn crew has successfully splashed down. Welcome back to planet Earth, Polaris Dawn. SpaceX recovery team now moving into place to begin the process of strapping the Dragon capsule up with the necessary uh, rigging in order to lift it onto the recovery vessel. Welcome back to planet Earth, Polaris Dawn. What a beautiful sight indeed. I don't know if both of you were just holding your breath like I was as it slowly <laughs> uh, descended at miles. I mean, talk me through that. Those four parachutes came out. I I'm sure for the astronauts, <laughs> that must have just uh, been e extraordinary, you know, moments away from, from splashing down. Well, Jared Isaacman, when he was doing his spacewalk, talked about uh, the perfect world beneath him. Uh, but I have a feeling looking up at those parachutes, the, the, the four perfect parachutes probably were his second favorite site of this mission uh, because that when, when you see those, you know you're home. And uh, what beautiful thermal imagery we've gotten from the dry tortugas of the Gulf of Mexico uh, watching that ever so hot capsule, as you can see, because it's bright white. And those billowing parachutes doing their job, bringing this uh, crew of four home. Uh, a successful mission and a, and a real milestone in the history of commercial space activity, which after years of talk and, you know, many years of development, really has taken off in, in the past few years. And, and we're, we're entering a new era here, which portends the possibility of many more people having access to space, on And that's an exciting prospect. Uh, Janet, I mean, this mission has really gone off without a hitch. There were a lot of people beforehand uh, talking about the risks, the challenges involved, but, but here it has achieved uh, what, what so many didn't think was possible. Uh, it's been nothing short of amazing, but the truth is these are incredible professionals that have spent the last couple of years training together, scuba diving together, hiking together. They have been on a mission to make sure that everything worked as perfectly. They trained diligently. And, you know, it was really impressive for Jared to say that Sarah, who has trained many of the astronauts that have flown on the Dragon capsule before, should also also experience what she's actually training those astronauts for. So again, another incredible kind of like story they're all going to have to tell. I can't wait to kind of see them egress from their capsule and see the smiles as they are back here on Earth. But something to remember that it was December of 1903 when the Wright brothers actually kind of conquered human space flight and powered flight for the first time. So here we are almost 121 years later and we're seeing another new development in in flight and aerospace. And that's just amazing because even the suits they're wearing, uh, SpaceX took the last two and a half years to develop. And again, these suits could one day or some iteration thereof be the ones that humans will be walking about on Mars in. And so again, for all of the science that they did, all of the medical testing, everything, that, all the data they're gonna bring back, again, well done all, bravo and brava. It's been a, quite a mission to follow. Miles, we've just seen a, a boat come into to the screen. It, it's gone off the screen now, but uh, talk us through what happens from here? There is a ship that is standing by, obviously, to collect the crew and then collect the spaceship. Uh, yeah, walk us through that. Well, they'll grab the spaceship, bring it back to the recovery vehicle, and the crew will uh, leave the capsule once it's on the vehicle. It's not, not quite like they used to do it back in the Apollo days. Uh, so uh, they, they're going to sit there and uh, test their ability to handle motion sickness after what they've just been through. Uh, it looks like a pretty calm sea, which is, of course, uh, very specifically uh, forecast and what they were looking for in this case. Uh, and then uh, they'll, they'll get on helicopters, make their way to land and uh, be reunited with loved ones. And I know that'll be a special moment for all of them. Janet, talk us through this process of acclimatization, uh, because what they've put their bodies through the last five days, 
uh, I guess no one has done for, for a very long time. I mean, they have exposed themselves to, to higher levels of radiation than the astronauts on the International Space Station. Uh, they, they, they now have to, you know, I, I guess, as I say, acclimatise being back on Earth. Talk us through um, what they will be going through. Well, every astronaut I've ever spoken to says that upon landing, you have this weird sensation of just heaviness. You've had this experience of lightness of being and microgravity. And then all of a sudden, you're very aware of how heavy everything feels. And I can imagine they're going, wait a minute. It's like, all, all, you know, again, this ah, feeling, again, the, the amount of like G's they've been, you know, kind of through as they re enter the Earth's atmosphere, then all of a sudden, again, that kind of soft landing. So I'm sure their inner ear, it's weird, in microgravity, we can't tell what is up or down. And so again, that part of our cochlea helps us kind of orient and create that creates equilibrium for us. The so part of that is probably just their brain reprocessing all of the things that are part of being in a 1G environment. But again, part of that heaviness that they feel has to also be part exhilaration, knowing all that they've accomplished. Mars, it looks like there are a couple of uh, speedboats uh, and, and they've hooked on to the, the spaceship, which you can see bobbing uh, in the water. So is a ship going to, to come along and, and take the, the spaceship out of the water? How, how does it work? Yeah. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna rendezvous in the water there. Uh, the, the the crew right now is attaching various pieces of rigging and so forth that make all this facilitates this process of getting the capsule onto the recovery uh, vessel. Uh, and you'll notice that they're wearing uh, respirators because there are uh, hypergolic fuels involved, meaning these are chemicals that. Uh, combust in the presence of each other, and you got to be very careful because there could be some remnants of that around the capsule. And so they want to uh, sort of, you know, electronically sniff the air, make sure it's safe for them to egress because you do, they're they're going to be walking out into whatever that micro atmosphere is. So uh, the process right now is about just getting the capsule kind of. Um, well, I guess, uh, you know, you could call it like netting the capsule, I suppose, without the net, but uh, reeling it in, getting it onto the larger ship and allowing the crew to uh, get back on and then get onto a helicopter. The water looks incredibly still. Obviously, the, the weather was a huge component of all of this. There was that delay uh, in Polaris Dawn launching. It was supposed to happen uh, last month. And then on the actual day that it launched, it had to be delayed a couple of hours because of, of thunderstorms. But it would seem very still, Janet. Uh, tell us how, how important, I guess, the weather was uh, for this splashdown. Again, when you're splashing down, you also don't want to be combating hurricane kinds of winds or waves and any kind of real turbulence there. It's like especially after, you know, reentry and everything. So the weather's hugely important. Again, the, the most important resource in all of human spaceflight are humans. So you're going to want to make sure that every, every kind of uh, scenario is favorable. And so it was super wise for them to wait. I'm sure that it was a little daunting to be you know, ready to go and then have to wait day after day and, and that. But again, we're seeing completely calm seas and that's exactly what this crew deserves uh, upon arrival back on Earth. Uh, Miles, I'm interested in, uh, in the medical checks now that the crew uh, will go through, considering what they have put their body through the, these past five days. Well, you know, a big part of this mission was, in fact, uh, making themselves uh, lab rats, if you will, Anna. They, uh, the first thing they did was they flew to this very high altitude. And part of the reason they did that uh, was to put themselves in what are known as the Van Allen belts, which are an area of uh, particularly high radiation environment. And uh, if you're ever going to send humans to Mars, they're going to have to spend a lot of understanding exactly that environment and how you might shield them against it uh, to keep them safe um, is, is an important piece of this, and which hasn't been really fully solved as we think about 
long duration space flights uh, to Mars with the current chemical rockets uh, we have. But in addition to that, they 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 have all kinds of uh, medical um, uh, experiments going on on them, including in, in the case of Kim Potit, he has an implant to, to help them further understand what's been happening to him physiologically. Now, five days is you know not a particularly long mission by today's standards. We have astronauts who've gone well past a year. We've been talking a lot about that crew, you know, so, quote unquote, stranded on the International Space Station and how they will spend a year there. What we find with astronauts who spend a long time in the absence of gravity is uh, you, you lose a lot of calcium in, in your bones. Your bec bones become more brittle and weak. Your cardiovascular system uh, degrades quite a bit. Uh, you end up, believe it or not, uh, and I don't fully understand it, except it has something to do with the way fluids are distributed in our, in our systems. But uh, some astronauts experience uh, long-term vision loss, believe it or not. All these things uh, NASA has been working on for the, throughout the course of the International Space Station. Uh, but each time you answer a question, there's, there's another question that comes up. And so this crew was a part of pushing that even further forward. So they will be spending a lot of time downloading data from their bodies, if you will, to compare it to what they were like before, what happened during, and what happened after to get some good science. Janet, uh, just before we go, uh, this, of course, is the, the first of three planned missions as part of the Polaris program. What is next in, in store, perhaps, for this team? Uh, you know, I think for this team, they've got an incredible story to tell. I know that Jared himself is looking forward to, you know, the next two missions that are currently planned. I think, I think truthfully, it's going to only amp up in kind of like more and more kind of like adventurous kinds of things that they're going to attempt. I mean, when you think about that, that entire capsule was open to the vacuum of space. It was quite, it was quite risky for the entire team, but so valuable to learn what is possible in these EVA suits. So I think we're gonna see amazing, amazing kinds of science and other plans. And, um, you know, I think, I can see that if Jared, you know, he's got a heart for philanthropy, the millions of dollars that both Inspiration4 and Polaris Dawn have raised for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. I like his idea that whatever the next two missions entail, I think you're gonna see them actually by the, uh, by the third mission, they will be even kind of like testing out one of SpaceX new heavier rockets uh, in the future. But again, I think whatever he's doing out there in space, he still has an eye on benefit, benefiting the children of Earth by donating and raising money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. So both of those things are exciting, but I think we'll see different capsules. We'll probably see some different kinds of, uh, and other kind of science there. And again, they will be experimenting, I think by the third one, one of the heavier rockets of SpaceX. Well, it really is extraordinary what we have just witnessed, the safe return of Polaris Dawn with that splashdown into the Gulf of Mexico off the coast of Florida. I'm so pleased uh, we all got to experience it uh, with you. Uh, Miles O'Brien and Janet Ivey, thank you for your expertise and, and for walking us through it. Stay with CNN. Much more after the break.